This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. If you're a seeker, don't miss the inspiring book, Shamanic Awakening, Between the Dark and the Daylight. This remarkable work chronicles shamanic counselor and indigenously trained dream decoder Sandra Cochran's 35 years of experience with diverse wisdom keepers throughout the Americas. Sandy's initiations across the British Isles, Turkey, Greece, and Egypt, combined with her knowledge of symbology, psychology, and myth, influence her dream blog and workshops. Sandy offers private readings, sacred international journeys, a meditative CD, and her book, Shamanic Awakening, to encourage you as you navigate your earth walk and create a deeper connection to yourself. Find this and more at her website, starwalkervisions.com. This is A Different Perspective with Kevin Randall. A retired U.S. Lieutenant Colonel, Kevin Randall has been studying UFOs for nearly 50 years. Kevin has investigated some of the most famous UFO cases in the world and has been consulted for dozens of documentaries about UFOs. Considered one of the leading experts into the Roswell UFO crash of 1947, Kevin has written more than 25 books about UFOs, including the recently published Roswell in the 21st century. Now, here is the host of A Different Perspective, Kevin Randall. And good evening. I am joined tonight by a friend of mine, Nick Redfern, whom I've known for a number of years, and uh, he seems to have followed me into Texas, meaning I lived in Texas a long time ago, and now he lives there. Um, he has written a book called Secret Societies, The Complete Guide to History, History's Rites and Rituals, which uh, is due out in March, and I happen to have a copy sitting on my desk, and apparently Nick does not have a copy, so I went up on him there. I have a long introduction, and I'm not sure that people really need an introduction to Nick because he's been everywhere in the last few weeks on the radio and television. But uh, I will tell you that he's worked as a freelance feature writer for the Daily Express, People, Western Daily Press, and Express and Star newspapers, as well as a full-time feature writer for Planet on Sunday. He has been a freelance journalist for the British newsstand magazines, The Weekender, Animals, 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 Pet Reptile, Military Illustrated, I Spy, The Open Files, and The X Factor. This Animals, Animals, Animals sounds like something the Monty Python would have done. <laughs> It was actually um, an old English magazine for children where you would buy it in, in uh, stores and it would build up into like uh, volumes, you know, you'd, you'd buy them each week and put them in, in uh, like volume folders. I was, uh, I'm going to skip over some of this because I think everybody knows you're on the lecture circuit. You've been seen on television programs like Monster Quest, UFO Hunters. I'm impressed with the National Geographic channels, Paranormal, and the Sci-Fi channels Proof Positive. But what I liked was uh, you've been identified as a member of an informal group of friends, often called upon, called others as the Paranormal Rat Pack and the Cabal. And other members uh, are film member, uh, other members of the group are filmmaker Paul Kimball and authors Greg Bishop and the late Mac Tonius, which is too bad. Mac was a good guy. And in 2012, he took on the role of an on-air radio talk show host. Well, there you go. Nobody's done that recently. Uh, <laughs> and a paranormal par paranormal thing. <laughs> Uh, internet radio show, Epic Voyages Radio, produced by the Inception Radio Network. Uh, Nick Redfern, welcome to A Different Perspective. Oh, well, thanks a lot, Kevin. Although I have to just sort of burst bubbles, if, if that's the right word. But I think that whole Rat Pack Cabal thing was 
was created as a joke because I was actually <laughs> told about it rather than actually knowing I was even a part of it. And uh, I mean, I don't think I've actually seen Paul for probably eight or nine years now, something like that. And um, Greg, I see about once a year. Um, and of course, Matt unfortunately died. But uh, I guess you can really only be a rat pack if you actually hang out and do things together, <laughs> you know, which... Uh, so. But, but you can you can hang out together online now and and well, Skype true. and all that's that true. sort of thing. And I, you know I haven't I haven't seen Paul Kimball in a long time, and I know he's been involved in a couple of these ad hoc uh, UFO investigations. Most recently, he was part of the Roswell Slides Research Group, which helped uh, yes. de de blur the placard and kind of send that whole thing crashing down in a matter of minutes. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it's kind of the, the thing that's been going on for a long time. We have those sorts of things. Things uh, I mentioned secret societies, which is not going to be available for, to the general public for a couple of months yet. But it's just, uh, a long book that deals with an awful lot of information about, well, uh, uh, histories, rites, and rituals. I mean, secret organizations uh, from, I guess, the uh, Masons. Uh, you talk about the Kennedy assassination. You talk about whether Hitler survived the war and that sort of thing. So I was just wondering um, if there was uh, anything that you'd like to add to that. I mean, what, uh, were there some parts of this that really excited you? So we'll talk a little bit about what's in secret societies. And like I was kind of saying before, did you have a, a part that excited you? Well, yeah, one of the stranger parts of the book uh, revolves around a British UFO secret society, if you like, known as APEN, or the Aerial Phenomena Inquiry Network. And they surfaced under mysterious circumstances in the UK in the early to mid-1970s. And they sort of portrayed themselves as a sort of a clandestine UFO research group that was going to try and get to the heart of the mystery but they didn't want their identities known, and they would send out these strange, sort of couched, unsigned letters to various people in ufology looking for help and information on latest cases. Uh, now, Nick, Nick, I'm going to have to yeah. cut you off there because we're going to have we're, we're up against our break, and we will be back to talk about Apron in just a minute. And you can take a look at uh, Nick Redfern's site at uh, nickredfern14.blogspot.com, and you can get usually more information about what I have to say at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And as I say, we will return in just a couple of minutes with Nick Redfern talking about his book on secret societies, and we'll talk about UFOs, and we'll talk about whether Hitler actually survived the war, and if those ideas of searching for him in today's environment are worth anything. So please stick around. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. How would you like to be able to read other people's minds? Well, the next best thing is here. When you know how to read a person's name, you know how the person thinks, feels, and behaves. Each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence. Our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime. Nemology Science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names, including the first and last impression people remember about us. Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Nemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. 
If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today. Know the name, know the person. Or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere, Florida. Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine such as hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a southern flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining rooms can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you visit, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic downtown Felsmere. Or visit marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, Old Florida cuisine at its best. We are back with Nick Redfern. I cut him off when he was talking about Apron, Apron, which is a British secretive UFO group. And uh, you want to continue with that? Uh, tell us a little. They, they sent out a letter to UFO researchers. They wanted to stay in the background. And did they get anywhere with their research or have they kind of disappeared? Well, this is sort of a really interesting and weird story because what happened was not only did Apron send out these sort of anonymous letters to numerous people um, in ufology of, in the early 70s, people who were sort of you know, really at the forefront, people like Jenny Randalls back then. And um, they, as I said, they, they essentially were presenting themselves as a group that wanted to stay in the background and investigate um, significant cases and essentially get involved with everyone in ufology. Now, things got a little bit disturbing because as well as sending out letters, they sent out um, cassettes, audio cassettes, playing, um, like, for example, um, Nazi, the type of music the Nazis played during the Second World War when uh, Adolf Hitler was on parade and things like this. And they clearly had some sort of extreme right-wing agenda. Now, the more that people looked into it, the more they came to two possible scenarios. One was that they actually were some sort of ultra-right-wing group that was trying to infiltrate ufology and, in, in essence, sort of uh, recruit people to their right-wing agenda by pulling them out of the UFO field. Um, in other words, it was like a strange form of recruitment, if you like. The other theory, which is an interesting one, is that APEN was actually sort of a, a shadowy group established by some elements of the British government or the intelligence community that was trying to disrupt British ufology um, by pitting people against each other and trying to smear the subject by suggesting it was sort of linked with ultra-right-wingers and Nazis. And a number of UFO researchers of that era came to believe that this group was some sort of like a secret society within government whose role and whose mandate was to disrupt British ufology. And um, they still surface very occasionally to this day, but they, they, they're most prominent in the 1970s. And they also popped up in relation to the Rendleton Forest case in 1980. So, um, but every time they surfaced, it was essentially to sort of sow the seeds of uh, sort of discourse and, um, you know, disrupt the various groups that existed at the time. Well, from what you're saying, it seems to me that they um, are supposedly like the, the alleged MJ-12 in this country, which, of course, we have no documentation for. But from what you say, there's actually documentation. This group existed in that they were kind of manipulating things behind the scene. I mean, it's not like MJ-12 where we got a lot of documents that uh, have no provenance, but you've got some documents here that do have that sort of thing, have a provenance. Well, you know where they yeah, came we from. Have documents. Yeah, there's no doubt that, you know, the researchers who, for example, were um, attached to the British UFO Research Association, Bufora, in the 70s, 
and they were recipients of uh, letters from Ape. And as I said, Jenny Randall's was. Um, they sent out these bizarre cassettes playing Nazi music. Um, so in other words, somebody was doing this, and a number of these um, letters and communications came from all around the country. So, you know, it wasn't just from one little town, say, in the north of England or anything like that. So whoever it was, they had a, a large network of people. But Jenny Randalls herself um, said that she was in no doubt that one of the primary um, results of Apen's work, if that's the right word to use, was to try and destabilise and fracture British ufology. And, of course, the big question is, why would they do that? And, and you know, was there some sort of official agenda or was it a private agenda? We don't really have the answers beyond the fact that whatever this sort of secret group was, they did exist to perform some sort of specific task. Were there any names attached to it? Well, there were, but it was it was generally sort of um, just bizarre names like um, General Smith or Colonel Jones. It was kind of like that thing. There was never anything where, um, you know, anything could be really tracked down. And, you know, there were never any um, sort of real names or addresses given. You know, in England, you don't sort of have to put your own address on the front of the envelope. You can just mail a, a letter with the recipient's name and address on. So sometimes it can be very hard to sort of, you know, determine who's sending you mail, really. So. But un unlike MJ-12, it, uh, which had a list of government officials on the the first document, I mean, honest to God, real officials who uh, unfortunately were all dead by the time the MJ-12 document surfaced, but you had no list of names like that, that uh, they didn't sign it by Lord Mountbatten, for example. Um, no, it was sort of far more sort of covert and, and hidden. And it was almost as if it was just sort of um, playing with people's minds, you know, that just the fact that people all across the UK in ufology were getting anonymous letters of a quite disturbing nature. Um, and, you know, when you sort of look at it from that perspective, I think sort of perhaps psychologically destabilizing some of the people who may have been, you know, sort of a little bit of a, you know, sort of a quieter character. They, you can understand how they might have sort of been intimidated by this. And some actually did leave ufology because they found the whole thing sort of quite disturbing, rather than standing up into, against them and saying, you know, stop sending me letters <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> so um, it, was a, it was a very strange story and sort of a, a very little known one of this sort of a hidden group in British ufology. Does it relate to men in black at all? Um, I've been asked that question before, and I think it does in the sense that, you know, the whole angle of, um, intimidation was, is clearly present in both phenomena, you know, Apen and the men in black. Now, of course, the big question is, do you have sort of multiple groups and multiple agendas that some might be of a similar nature? I think that's probably more the case. I don't think there was sort of, you know, you, you could trace Apen back to like an agency in the U.S. or something like that. I think this was definitely something British-based, um, and sort of, you know, psychologically profiling some of the people in ufology and, you know, doing certain things that cause them to be sort of fearful for doing the research they're doing. You know, a lot of thought had gone into this. It wasn't, you know, sort of a classic case of some spotty teenager just having a few laughs and jokes. So if you read the letters and the, all the communications, it was sort of psychologically created to sort of make it look like they were trying to help British ufology when in reality destabilizing it, breaking it up and just sort of pitting different researchers against each other was the were the primary goals. So there's no evidence that it linked back into the government at all? Um, no, there isn't. But um, the one reason why certain researchers thought that was the case was because Apen didn't sort of focus on lights in the sky or even abductions or contact cases. There weren't many abductions back then in the UK, but certainly there were sort of contact type cases. They didn't really focus on those. They focused on cases involving the military and the government. And in many cases, they tried to play down the importance of these cases. That's, you know, they popped up, as I said, in relation 
to Rendlesham and, and alluded to the idea that, um, you know, it may have been something more down to earth than, um, you know, a UFO. So in that sense, you know, if they were somehow tied to the government or to the military or military intelligence, then you might have an explanation as to why they would suddenly jump up every time, you know, a significant military case occurred and actually got out into ufology, you know, that somebody sort of spilled the beans, so to speak. Um, so I find that interesting, you know, that they didn't just surface in rela or hardly ever surface in relation to regular UFO cases. It was always when there was a little bit of controversy, controversy that might sort of be traced back to, you know, the official world. Well, you do say military cases and, and they would pop up with their uh, important military cases. Did they pop up when the uh, Ministry of Defense started releasing their UFO files into the public arena? <laughs> Excuse me. They actually didn't. But um, in one or two of their communications, they did allude to having in their possession certain government and military files on UFOs that weren't in the public domain. And they kind of talked about those in, in almost like a taunting fashion, sort of a, we know something you don't know, that, that kind of scenario. Now, whether that, again, was true or whether it was designed to sort of reel people in because, you know, people in ufology, they love sort of stories of um, government files and hidden files. And so whether or not they actually had the, the real files or not, I think there was possibly a plan to to use this scenario of, hey, we've got these files as a means to sort of have these people, have the researchers fall even more under the fold of, um, of APEN and the, under the sway of APEN, um, you know, just, just by sort of dangling the carrot, so to speak. Do they still exist? Have they surfaced uh, any time in the last, say, five years or something? Um, I've not heard anything in the last five years, but um, I actually um, wrote briefly about APEN in an earlier book in 2006 um, called On the Trail of the Source of Spies, and I, you know, I sort of addressed all these different theories in there, and I actually got a phone call about, probably about a month or two after the book came out, so this would have been I think, sort of late 2006, and I got a, like a phone call, like 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and um, from somebody with a with an English accent, which unfortunately, you know, he just came up on the idea as like private caller or, or unknown call or something like that. And it was somebody screaming down the phone, basically saying words to the effect of how dare you smear the, the you know, the words of Apen and so on. And do you know what's going to happen to you? That kind of thing. And, you know, I'm not the sort of person who sort of you know, runs quivering in the corner to something like that. So I basically, well, I won't use the words that I used on uh, on the phone, um, but you can get an idea of my response. Um, but, you know, whether that was some sort of hoax or somebody just joking around or somebody still in Apen, you know, I don't know, but they took the time to sort of find my phone number in, here in the U.S., which was not, you know, uh, online, and uh, they were clearly speaking in an English accent. It was actually like a Southern England, well, actually Southwest accent. I knew exactly this part of the country where the accent was. Um, and, you know, it, it was just, it was a sort of a demonstration, if you like, that, yes, Apen may still be around and still up to their tricks sort of now and again. Well, it seems to me that if you're living in Texas, you should have informed them of that and explained to them that, uh, the mindset of Texans, which is uh, everybody's got a, a rifle rack in the back of their pickup yeah. truck and you're all heavily armed. And uh, any time you yeah. feel froggy, just take a leap, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Well, that's right. I mean, I, I mean, I basically told them what to go and do and, and they hung <laughs> up after that. And I think that kind of reflects their approach. If you stand up to them, as I did, and just basically told them what to go and do, then, you know, that they and I never heard from them again. I, I do know for sure that some people in ufology who were clear in the 70s, I mean, I was just a kid back then, so I wasn't involved then, but, you know, following up years later, I do know of a number of researchers who got very, not just concerned, but downright terrified by all this. Nick, and we're going to have...
Nick, we're going to have to take a quick break here once again. The time just flies by. I can't believe it. Uh, you can take a look for Nick Redfern at nickredfern40n.blogspot.com. And when we come back, I'm going to try to shift the conversation and move a little bit to the idea which is in his book about uh, Hitler being still alive. So we will return uh, right after this. So please stick around. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Gwilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we'll weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Mutual Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. Gibbs A. Williams, Ph.D., is a practicing psychoanalyst, supervisor, researcher, and author in New York City. Much of his life has been dedicated to understanding nature and the uses of meaningful coincidences or synchronicities. His radical and original non-Jungian, non-mystical, non-magical theory of synchronicities illuminates much of the fog surrounding this challenging and perplexing topic. His ideas and manners are fresh, presented in a style that is both entertaining and highly informative. He is also an expert on crisis intervention, specially focused on violence reduction for the police and citizens, mastering anxiety, frustration, and stress without the use of medication, and effectively preventing and treating heroin addiction. Dr. Williams can be contacted at his email address at gwwilliamsny11 at aol.com or visit his website at... Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the X-Zone Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. True healing must address four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, for us to live joyful and productive lives. We tend to treat three of the four, leaving the spiritual languishing. If you're tired of the same dysfunctional patterns cropping up in your life, soul balancing is for you. Trixie Phelps, owner and founder of Soul Balancing, is a naturally gifted energy healer trained in numerous esoteric forms, including shamanism. Trixie has created a powerful modality that safely and effectively clears your energetic field. A soul balancing session can remove interference, heal trauma, and restore your hope. Contact Trixie for a life-changing long-distance session today, www.soulbalancing.world. We have returned with Nick Redfern, 
and we were talking about Apron and uh, his <laughs> response to them, suggesting that he wasn't frightened by them, and uh, they haven't bothered him since. But one of the things that uh, struck me as you were talking about Apron is they were sending you Nazi-type music and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And in your book, Secret Societies, uh, you have a short segment about whether or not Adolf Hitler survived the Second World War, survived uh, the fall of Berlin in 1945 and escaped to South America. And um, I was just wondering, did you have any specific evidence that that is true? Or how exactly did you um, come to include this in the book, I suppose, is the best way to, to uh, 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 mention it, other than to say, uh, does Odessa mean anything when we get to talking about that? But if... Mm. Well, we can go into that in a moment. So anyway, uh, tell me about the, the, the Hitler section of the book. Well, the reason I included that, although it deals with sort of secret societies and so on, it also sort of focuses on cabal, what we might call cabals and things like this. So the theme was, although it was, you know, did Hitler survive the war, it also revolved around, you know, sort of secret cabals involved in getting Hitler out of Germany and... Um, you know, surviving the war and being sent to or getting over to South America and so on. Now, the reason why I included this in the book, you know, we've heard a lot of these stories for a long time that Hitler, <coughs> Hitler survived the war and, you know, lived on in, under an alias in South America. But why I chose to talk about it was because, as I'm sure you know, just a few years ago, back in 2011, the FBI um, created its new or its latest website, The Vault, um, where you can find literally hundreds of thousands of pages, maybe millions, I don't know, of formally classified files on all different subjects, UFOs, Marilyn Monroe, Frank Sinatra, or you name it, you know, if the FBI investigated it, a lot of those files are now online at its website, The Vault. And one of the files is titled Adolf Hitler. And if you read that file, what it actually is, it's not sort of... Um, a historical file, like a biographical file on Hitler or anything like that. The entire file is devoted to letters and communications and rumors that reached the FBI that Hitler had survived the war and made his way to South America. So, in other words, although, you know, the theory that Hitler did survive the war is an extremely controversial one, and for many people it's a highly unlikely one, but what I found particularly fascinating wasn't just the, you know, the theory that Hitler could have survived the war, but the fact that the FBI was secretly collating numerous data on all these rumors and stories and trying to figure out what the truth was behind them. So, you know, that's what sort of fascinated me more was this sort of um, ongoing program to sort of research, you know, did this cabal exist? Did some secret group of post-war Nazis get Hitler out of Germany and to South America. You know, that just the mere fact that the file was opened to specifically investigate that was something that sort of intrigued me. Well, there were two things that sprung to my mind as you were talking about that. One, as I mentioned earlier, was Odessa, and that was a, um, I believe, an organization run by the SS at the end of the war, which the whole purpose was to get uh, high-ranking Nazis and loyal Nazis yeah. out of Germany and into South America or other places where they could uh, make a life for themselves. So there, there was an organization that did that, and we know that it was successful because it got guys into like like um, uh, Mengele and um, Eichmann into South America. And the other thing that struck me was we get an awful lot of things like that but of, of famous people uh, – or notorious people, uh, surviving their deaths. Davy Crockett supposedly didn't get killed at the Alamo. He was uh, captured and taken to Mexico. Uh, Jesse James really wasn't assassinated by Ford. He uh, escaped into somewhere else. Uh, Butch Cassidy lived for years and years after uh, his uh, supposed death in South America. So, you know, it's that kind of thing. But I can see where after the war, there there was no Hitler body that could be found. And so that would be a logical conclusion. Did he survive? And you have people telling you that, yeah, we saw him here or he did this, or here's a picture of him uh, in Brazil or something like that. Yeah. I mean, you're right about Odette. You know, there's, that's one of the reasons why there were this, there was this sort of ongoing collection of data every time another rumor surfaced about Hitler, because although 
it was never proved that Hitler survived the war. You're right, it, it was proved that there was this program to, you know, get high-ranking Nazis out of Germany and out of Europe completely as well. Um, so, you know, it was almost like one of those where there's smoke, there's fire scenarios, or there could be fire. Um, and so for that reason, you know, it was perceived as being plausible. And you're correct when you say that, you know, there are a lot of controversies surrounding Hitler's uh, final days and final hours and whether or not, you know, his corpse was, his burned corpse was found or was it really him or was it a, you know, a lookalike. So I think as long as these theories sort of stay open, um, the questions are always going to be asked, whether it's by researchers, the general public, or with this file, you know, by the FBI as well. I remember seeing a program not too long ago, and that's why I kind of focused on this Hitler thing. It might have been in the last week or so about Hitler surviving the war. And one of the things they'd done, and, um, and I don't know the name of the street that's near the Brandenburg Gate, but they had cleared that in the final days of, of the war so that they could, uh, so it was sort of like a big long runway and they cut down the uh, lamp, lamp post so they could fly air, aircraft in and out. So the idea was they were preparing this so they could um, take Hitler out of out of Germany as the uh, Russians finally kind of overwhelmed everything. Uh, did you run into anything about that or, uh, you know, uh, anything that might, might add to that? Well, not, not that specific one, but, I mean, one of the things I found interesting about this particular file that I talk about in the book is that some of the accounts were extremely detailed. You know, it wasn't just along the lines of, oh, I met a guy in a bar who told me Hitler was, you know, taken out of the country, and I can't remember the guy's name. It was not like that. It was talking about specific submarines and... Um, specific places in South America where Hitler was dropped off and then where he made his way to, you know, a little town and so forth. And some of the people who were reportedly involved and how the process went ahead. And there was a great deal of sort of communication between the FBI and the State Department's, uh, various State Department's um, offices and embassies in South America to try and figure out if there was anything to this. So, you know, the, so, then that was purely and simply because a lot of the accounts that came through were highly detailed. That that was one of the things that sort of motivated the FBI. So we've we've decided Hitler probably didn't uh, survive the war. I mean, is that the conclusion you kind of came to? Yeah, I think you know he, he probably didn't. But it's like a lot of these different stories. You know, whether it's Jack the Ripper or or even Roswell. You know that um, we know. Something happened, and maybe this happened, maybe that happened, and so things are always a little bit still wide open. And I think that's the same with the Hitler story: is that the door will never be closed until we know for sure. And when you have sort of intriguing stories that do have a little bit of merit to them, and you know background data, then it's inevitable that you know it's never really going to go away. Well, it seems to me that uh, once the Soviet Union collapsed, there was a, a search for remains of Hitler and that yeah. the Soviets had collected some uh, bone fragments near the, the big bunker there where Hitler spent his last uh, 10 days or so. And I remember they were talking about some DNA testing from um, relatives of Hitler. And I'm not sure if I was a relative of Hitler, I'd be men mentioning that to anybody. <laughs> But uh, they were going to run some DNA tests, and I don't—I haven't heard anything about whether those tests were positive or negative or anything like that. And I, I kind of wondered if maybe you'd heard something uh, in the last uh, few months since you kind of got an interest in this. Yeah, not really. There's, there's been no sort of major development or anything definitive, really. You know, it's all sort of a, a wait and see, and, and if it even will go any further, you know, it's um, it's it's just kind of hit like a a brick wall, really. Um, but, I mean, when certainly when the FBI posted its file, you know, this prompted a great deal of interest and I think probably prompted a number of um, TV shows and documentaries that surfaced in the wake of the of the uh, uploading of the file to the, to the Vault web. So um, I would be at all surprised if further data doesn't sur it does surface. You know, I think it probably will. Uh, but whether or not it'll actually 
resolve things or just make things even more confusing. You know, kind of the latter scenario is the one that usually, you know, is the one that sort of uh, plays out. Yeah, that's kind of the bad thing about UFO research and yeah. this kind of research in general. Even when you have a definitive answer, there are people who are going to say, no, that's not true, that the CIA got to the witness or somebody yeah. bought them off or something like that. You just cannot, even if you have a definitive answer, there are going to be people who just simply do not accept it. Yeah, and I mean, I think ufology, you know, is often guilty of that because there's that sort of Fox Mulder, I want to believe um, mentality sort of takes over sometimes you know not deliberately just unconsciously subconsciously people want their favorite cases to be this and they want it to be that and if you suggest something else um it's like well why are you doing it what's your agenda well there's no agenda you're just looking for evidence of this or that and uh you know it's um well, it's hard to explain to people. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's hard to explain to people that sometimes the evidence doesn't take you where you want it to mm. want to go. It takes you somewhere else. And I think, as a researcher, or an investigator, or a writer, you're obligated to explore that path and say, "This is what I found. This is a great case, but." Here are the problems with it, and here's why we are no longer so excited about it, because here's what the evidence tells us, or the lack of evidence tells us. Uh, I'm well, sure you've read... Actually, yeah, what that does, that demonstrates, you know, um, being truthful and being unbiased and, and open to wherever the evidence goes. It's kind of like, you know, people would be amazed, you know, if you watch the same TV shows when you were 10 as you do at 30 or something. Of course, you're not going to watch you know, kids shows, you know, on a Saturday morning when you're 35 or whatever. And I think, but in ufology, it's almost like you have to be locked down into one mindset and you're not allowed to change. You know, it's like she's the abduction researcher. He does cattle mutilations and thinks it's biological warfare. The other guy thinks it's aliens. And it's almost like a, an 11th commandment. Thou shalt not change thy scenarios or ideas, you know. That's how it kind of comes across. And I've never really understood that mindset of why, if you supported one theory when you were 25, if you uncover new material when you're 35 and it takes you down a different path, well, there's nothing wrong with that. You're actually being honest in saying, hey, you know, my views have changed. Well, I think the thing that, that I've discovered or I've seen is that you suddenly get labeled as a flip-flopper and you are required. If you want to be invited to lectures, if you want people to buy your books, you have got to embrace all of ufology. You cannot say this part doesn't simply work. This part makes a little bit of sense to me. Uh, you have to embrace the whole thing. Uh, we're going to have to take our, our last break here. Uh, when, we, when we come back, I'd kind of like to talk to you about your emergency management, <laughs> federal emergency management agency section of the book where you're talking about the secret camps and all of that sort of thing. And if you want more information, you can take a look at Nick Redfern Fortian blogspot.com and I often uh, comment about our programs at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com so you can get a, a little bit of a different perspective about what we may have discussed during the program. We will return with Neck Redfern and maybe talk a little bit about FEMA right after this. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 
1-800-800-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? I'm Dr. Kimberly McGeorge, and on The Secret to Everything, we will merge the practical with open investigation into all realms of the mysterious. We will talk to cutting-edge alternative health practitioners, those who inspire and motivate you in business and life, and of course, we will share stories of the paranormal, conspiracy, and cryptozoology. You will transform because of the frequency I carry, the frequencies my guests carry. Life may never be the same after you listen to this program. For the secret to everything is for you, the listener, for those who desire more in every area of their lives and believe that it can still be found. Listen and discover the secret to everything.com. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. You're listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. I have returned with Nick Redfern, our guest tonight on A Different Perspective, and we've been talking about Secret Societies, which is his book coming out in March, and we've been talking about some other things as well that is very interesting, and I think we've finished with Adolf Hitler for a while, and because of that, I wanted to ask Nick about one of the things that he had mentioned in the book is he's got a segment on uh, FEMA, which is the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and... um, I noticed that you were talking about these camps that are secretly being constructed and that sort of – can you give me a little bit of background about that? Yeah, well, as you said, FEMA, which was uh, established in 78 and functional by 79, is a federal emergency management agency, and it provides sort of massive relief and support um, in relation to sort of large-scale disasters in and across the United States. You know, it does a lot of very good work. Um, but within the sort of darker side of um, conspiracy theorizing, there are these theories um, and whispers and rumors that FEMA has sort of a, another agenda, a secret agenda, which involves um, the creation of uh, what have become known as FEMA camps. The theory being that at some point in the near future, 
martial law might be declared and any sort of people viewed as dissenters and, um, you know, people who ask awkward questions will be sort of rounded up into these camps. Now, as wait, 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 out, wait, the, wait, let me let me put let me make one point clear. This all did not evolve in the last week after, after oh no. President Trump took the uh, oath of office. This is something that has been discussed for literally years. It's not something that's new. So we no, don't want. Right. Yeah. We don't want to go down that path. We we just want to make it clear that this is something is very very old. Oh yeah, this goes back um, certainly a couple of decades. Um, and you know, personally, I I'm extremely skeptical of this. You know, I'm not saying that FEMA hasn't you know plans for you know, creating um, what you might call camps, but not to sort of hold people in, in detention situations, but actually just for people whose homes may have been destroyed by tornadoes or earthquakes or, you know, God forbid, terror terrorist attacks, that kind of thing. Um, I, the problem I have with the theory about the FEMA camps and detention camps and concentration camps is that the theories and the rumours have been going on for decades, a couple of decades now, and yet nobody's successfully got a photograph of one of these disturbing camps, you know, with people in sort of black outfits wandering around, you know, in goose-step in style or whatever. That Nobody's ever proved that. It's all still very much at the, the rumour mill level. And I think there's a good reason for that, and that is because certain figures in the conspiracy uh, research field have sort of made the leap that the existence of plans to be put into place in emergency situations um, are part and parcel of a plan like a new world order type plan to um, you know annex the US and round up everybody who's ever dared say anything about anybody you know in government I, I don't personally see that happening but I included the chapter to demonstrate that there, or the, the section in the book to demonstrate that there actually is a significant number of people in conspiracy research who actively do promote the idea that there are so-called FEMA camps and they are sort of the closest thing you could imagine to, you know, like a concentration camp. But uh, as I said, I've personally seen no evidence at all of that. Well, as we're talking here, it strikes me that I keep bringing up things that are pretty far off the wall and probably untrue, which makes it sound like the book is just filled with these kind of wild speculations, which is not that is, itself is not true. For example, you have a chapter on the uh, uh, the Masons, and this is a real secret society that has existed for literally hundreds of years and have uh, been pointed at as kind of um, – uh, Running, running wild in the formation of the United States. I think that uh, there's a story coming out that Santa Anna made some kind of secret um, mace, Masonic symbol after he was captured at San Jacinto during the Texas War for Independence, and that was why Sam Houston let him go. So there are an awful lot of things in the book that are true secret societies and true uh, uh, histories of that sort of thing. Is there something that struck you that really kind of excited you that was uh, a true history, something that we can demonstrate as being true? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, I wouldn't want readers to think, it like, like you said, that it's just, you know, rumors and hearsay. No, what I've done is to hopefully take a very balanced look at secret societies and demystify the rumours and the legends surrounding them uh, from the fact, you know, and, and figure out what is fact and what is rumour and what is maybe somewhere in between, you know, like with the Apen group. Um, you know, was it a government agency? Was it somebody within ufology? But um, one of the things that does intrigue me, which, you know, is a verifiable thing and also sort of gets into the issue of secret societies and rites and rituals um, relates to the story of Jack Parsons, the, the famous rocket pioneer, um, who basically, you know, was responsible, not completely single-handedly, but, you know, for leading to the formation or creation of the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California. Now, Parsons was somebody who was not only a brilliant rocket scientist, but also an occultist um, who actually ran one of Alistair Crowley's lodges out in Pasadena, California in the 1930s and 40s. And so, you know, we have this man who was at the 
at the forefront of military rocket uh, research, but also engaged and involved with um, occult rituals, occult secret societies and things like this. And what's particularly intriguing is that every Halloween, um, the staff at the JPL reel out, wheel out, I should say, um, these mannequins of uh, Parsons and some of his colleagues, and they hold like almost like a, they pay homage to uh, to Parsons in this sort of kind of slightly bizarre um, ritualistic event on, on Halloween. So, you know, there's there's nothing particularly sinister about it, but it is kind of unusual in, in you know, in the same frame, so to speak. And well, you can say that about an awful lot of the secret societies, I think, that you talk about in the book. They're really pretty benign. They just are yeah. kind of couched in secrecy and, and maybe have nothing sinister going on. It's just uh, a way of having fun uh, one day a week or one day a month. Well, I'm certainly, I'm certain that comes into to a degree. And I think there's also the idea that for the people in the groups, it creates a sense of they have power that the rest of us don't have, even if it's just, you know, some sort of local um, group of retired businessmen or something, you know. There's always that atmosphere of, oh, a secret society. That means they're manipulating things and they're powerful. It may actually be the opposite, you know, that they've got low self-esteem and putting themselves in that position actually makes them feel good, you know. <laughs> well, the, the one group that you don't mention in the book is the Stonecutters. Well, it was one of these things where the publisher said, um, you know, we need 200 entries um, on as many secret societies as possible. I said, well, you know, if you want 200 entries, I'm limited to 200. So, you know, something had to go or something had to be left out. So. But, but you understand the Stonecutters was the, uh, was the organization on the Simpsons. And they were running yeah. everything. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm well, just not sure. I was going to say, I'm not sure. We talk about a couple of ones that were sort of um, uh, um, uh, sort of amusing and odd ones, like, for example, uh, the Sons of Lee Marvin, which was like um, a jokey secret society for uh, people who looked like Lee, the, act, the late actor Lee Marvin. <laughs> if you looked like Lee Marvin, you could join the group. So I do talk about some of the more jokey ones, but uh, what... What they, they didn't want, really, was me to sort of go into the issue of, you know, sort of secret societies that were specifically based in the world of fiction. You know, they didn't mind me talking about, you know, the Illuminati, which has popped up in numerous movies and whatever, but they wanted secret societies in the real world, whether they had merit or not. Well, and I notice you, you do something on MK Ultra, for example, and we know that's that was a real event. That really took place. Um, you do something on Mottok, which is the idea there was some kind of a secret research laboratory off what Long Island in uh, uh, New York where they were doing some kind of weird experiments and may have been involved in time travel. So you get into a lot of different things like that, not only which things that are uh, sort of fringy, but also things that are accurate. So you provide an awful lot of information that way, I think. Well, I try, you know, to sort of vary the stories and the, and the societies. You know, you don't just want to hear time and time again about groups that kind of mirror the Masons. You know, for the sake of the reader, you want to keep it sort of um, open and, and entertaining and informative. And that's why, you know, I talk about, um, like, everything from Jack Parsons to Adolf Hitler to... UFOs and, you know, you name it. I think it's important to demonstrate to people that the term secret society doesn't just mean a bunch of old guys lifting up their trouser leg and, you know, jumping around and performing some ritual. It actually sort of goes far beyond that. Well, that's, uh, you know, I, the thing you have to do is uh, try to keep the, the reader interested and provide some good information for them. And as I say, if you get a chance, take a look at uh, Secret Lies, uh, secret, sorry, secret society. <laughs> it says on the back of the book, secret, secrets, lies, and privilege, and I was looking at the wrong place, so secret societies. Hey, That's Nick, right. thanks an awful lot for taking some time with us tonight. We certainly appreciate your vast knowledge of all these subjects, and uh, right. I'm well, hoping sure. people will take a, take a good look at your book, and if you want more information about this, take a look at uh, Nick Redfern, uh, fortian.blogspot.com. Uh, you can uh, learn something more about that and uh, we will uh, of course uh, be talking about this at uh, kevinrandall.blogspot.com giving you a little bit more information about what was going on there 
and uh, take a look at Roswell in the 21st century. If you'd like to know where my head is on that specific thing at the moment, it'll give you a good idea of where we are. Next week, we're going to talk to Stan Gordon about uh, the Kecksburg UFO crash and his interest in uh, cryptozoology and that sort of thing. And I think that's going to be somewhat interesting as well. So next week, uh, that's where we will be. And if you get a chance, as I say, take a look at www.kevin.com.